Good evening. Uh, thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, this is an MPC guest author series event that I've been looking forward to since I've been doing MPC guest author series events. Um, tonight's guest author is one whose work I have been using in writing classes as long as I've been teaching writing classes, I think. Um, I started back in 1991. I think you started with The New Yorker in 88 or so, writing articles. So I think I started using your stuff at Penn State in a magazine article writing class that I had the opportunity to teach. And ever since, I, I pretty much um, have made hundreds of people buy and read at least this book, The Bullfighter Checks Her Makeup, um, which is a collection of Susan Orlean's profile pieces. Um, and for me, there, there's nobody better at doing that particular bit of creative nonfiction writing um, than our guest tonight. And she excels in uh, any number of other areas of creative nonfiction as well. Uh, travel writing, um, what, what, I don't know what we would call Rin Tin Tin. Canine biography writing? <laughs> canine biography writing. Um, she, she has uh, a new book project she's just completed. Um, I don't know if she's going to take the lid off that and mention it tonight, but uh, there's another one coming uh, to, to look forward to. Um, Susan's got all the, the greatest gifts that any, any journalist and any creative writer needs. She's got an incredible eye for detail, a marvelous ear for voices, an unending, unending curiosity about people, places, and things, um, and, a, and a very, very appealing writing voice. Uh, you can spend a lot of time reading Susan Orlean and never feel hectored, badgered, bullied. Uh, you feel like you're, you've been in good company uh, with, with a pleasant conversationalist. You learn a lot of good stuff. You have some laughs along the way. Um, I, always, I always enjoy spending time with the new articles in The New Yorker or anything new that I get to read. Um, that shows up in print. Looking forward to the new book, of course, and I quite often reread the other stuff. Um, this is, as I said, the guest author series. MPC has a very robust uh, writing community within it, and as a creative writing instructor here, I've been uh, thrilled to be doing this job for the last nine years or so since I got here, uh, teaching creative writing classes and discovering that there is no end of writing and reading going on in the Monterey area. Uh, people come to my classes just raring to go, and they, they challenge the heck out of me. Um, and I learn a lot from, from the people I work with. And these events are always well attended, and as part of these events, you, get to, you do get to ask questions after Susan's talk. Um, she'll let you know when. Don't push. Um, but, and questions about her work, questions about how that work gets done, questions about writing, um, she'll, she'll field them. And she'll let you know when she's done doing that, too. There are people I have to thank every time I do one of these events because um, I get to stand up here and talk and I, I get to hang out with the writers. Um, but this doesn't happen without a bunch of other people. And I'm, gonna, I, I'm not going to get them all by name. But the Humanities Division Office, Michelle Brock is indispensable in setting these things up. Diane Boynton, our, our Chair of Humanities. Um, great supporters of creative writing and the guest author series here. Um, Kristen Darkin is back there with the camera. She helps with our, our promotions and the, and the college website. Um, all the people today who helped because there was a glitch and we didn't have tables and chairs for our booksellers and our ticket sellers. And people came out of nowhere. Diane marshaled some help and we had faculty from different divisions and people carrying tables and chairs across campus. I love teaching here. You know, people just pitch in and help you out. I didn't have to go schlep tables around myself. Not that you're a schlep. I didn't mean to say that. Um, so I, I want to thank all those folks. Uh, the, the Monterey County Weekly helps us out with the advertising, obviously. Um, I haven't seen the article that they ran today, but I understand that they, they did put a blurb in there about check the website to make sure this is happening because of the weather. I, I hope that didn't cause anybody not to come, but uh, we had to be honest. We had to say, hey, there's a chance because of that storm out there. Uh, but without, without much further ado, I'm going to introduce a writer who's, who's given me endless hours of admiration and, and reading pleasure. Um, and she's going to speak tonight, and she told me that she's going to speak about the wisdom of ignorance. And that sounds marvelously oxymoronic to me. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking forward to that. And something about writing from passion, which I think if you read C Susan's work, um, you know that she is passionate about what she does. She has a passionate curiosity and a need to know. Um, and she, she gets there, and she finds out what she needs to know, and she translates it into 
compelling, engaging, captivating prose um, that I hope you all have read already and continue to read. And by the way, there are books for sale out there. So at the end of the uh, event, after the question and answers, we'll have Susan sit over here at a table and sign books if you would like her to do that for you as well. All right, so without further ado, I'm getting out of your way. And by the way, my name's Henry Marchand. Did I say that? I didn't say that. Yeah, I'm a creative writing guy here. But anyway, I'm gonna get out of your way and I'm going to introduce to you and ask you to join me in welcoming Susan Orlean. Well, thank you so much, Henry. And we've been working on this visit for um, kind of a long time, I think two years. So, and when the weather turned ugly in New York, I thought, I cannot believe this is gonna happen. So I'm really thrilled to be here, and I want to thank you all for being here, and thank the college for inviting me to be part of the series. How wonderful that you have writers come, and it's, as part of the writer, writing community, we're always grateful for a chance to speak to people and talk about our work, and I certainly am. So here's a question. What is a story? I think stories are answers to questions about a person, a place, a situation, a history, an event, an impression. What I think is really basic is having the question. When, when I first got out of college and <clears throat> I wanted to be a writer, the adage that um, was dangled in front of me as it was dangled in front of all young writers, was write what you know. Now here's the problem, I was 21, I didn't know anything. <laughs> but it was also confusing to me because I thought I wanna be a writer to write about what I don't know. This is where I began immediately to veer off onto my own path. <laughs> and. There is a, a version of being a writer where you develop expertise. <clears throat> and please excuse me, I'm getting over being sick, so I know I don't sound particularly good, but unless I keel over, I'm fine. Um, you know, there's a whole world of writing where you become knowledgeable about something and you write from the inside out. And I have a lot of respect for people t who do that. And there's certain things that require expertise. I mean, writing about nuclear disarmament, um, I'm glad the people who do that are people who are really knowledgeable. That was never the kind of writer I wanted to be. I think just in general, I wanted to be a writer about curiosity. I didn't want to be a specialist. And in fact, I almost deliberately resisted ever writing about the same subject more than once. And in a way, it's, it's kind of um, a huge waste because whenever I write about something, I have to become an instant expert in the subject. And then it's of no use to me at all after I've written the piece. And I often will be, will be asked if I would be interested in writing more about that subject. After I wrote The Orchid Thief, you can imagine, I was asked to write a lot about orchids, and I thought, I have no interest in ever writing about orchids again. <laughs> I, I love doing it, but I'm done. I don't need to write about this again. And actually, this is sort of interesting. I don't know how many of you have read my story, uh, The American Man, Age 10, from which I'm thinking of reading a little bit tonight, but for what is probably the 10th time I was asked today to write a version of that. This was American woman at age 10, and I've been asked to write The American Man at age 20, and The American Man at age you know, 11. And um, it's, it, it makes sense. I have the sunk cost, as they say, of having learned a subject that I could use again, but that never was what appealed to me about a writer. I, what appealed to me was stumbling onto something I didn't know and learning about it. I see my work as having these two very distinct possible kind of categories. 
One is the subject that I fall into that I knew nothing about, that I didn't even know existed. And that happens to me a lot. I will fall into hearing about something or, or uncovering something that I didn't even knew, know was there to be seen. So it's a little bit like discovering an extra room in your apartment where you think, I had no idea. I didn't know this was here. The other version of the story, of, of the kinds of stories I like to go d really immerse myself in, are exactly the opposite. The story that was so plain and so right in front of my face that it had never occurred to me that I had never looked at it very closely. And an example of that is some years ago when I was in a grocery store doing my shopping and I suddenly thought, oh my God, grocery stores, how do they work? How do they, how do, they do this? How do they get all this food in here? How do they know what to order? And the next thing I knew I was spending six weeks in a supermarket uh, and writing a story about the life and times of a grocery store. And what I loved is it was such an ordinary subject that at first glance you think you know, of course, we all go grocery shopping, you know it back and forth, but in fact you know nothing about it. You've never really thought what is this place really about. So those are these two very different categories, one coming from sheer surprise and one coming from what I like to call the shock of recognition, the thing that's so familiar that you're shocked by the realization that you really know nothing about it. I like not knowing anything about a story that I begin. I like it for a lot of reasons, which is I go into it as a student. And this is another way in which my, my professional life is really bifurcated. The first half of what I do when I'm doing a story is I'm a student. I'm doing a crash course in whatever the subject is. When I started working on The Orchid Thief, I promise you I knew nothing about orchids. Nothing. I hated them, actually. So not only did I know nothing, I didn't want to know anything. I think that's a great place to begin. Within a relatively short period of time, I had to learn as much as I could so that when I sat down to write, I would have the confidence of writing as if I knew a lot. So I go from being a student learning to being a teacher because to me, writing is teaching. It's teaching a story that you've just learned to your readers. It's showing them how and why the story captivated you. It's explaining to them the journey that you went through to learn about the subject. So those are two very different personas and it can sometimes be a, a, a bit of whiplash to move from the period of time where I'm throwing myself into learning about a subject to doing a very quick change and teaching people what I've learned. And I love that challenge. When I say I like not knowing, where, where I think there's wisdom and ignorance, I want to give you a very particular example. Um, and I, I I think I'd like to walk you through the sort of genesis of the story because it really gives you a good idea of how I go about my work. I always have loved gospel music. I just love the sound of gospel music. I didn't know anything about it, I, but I just loved the way it sounded. One day when I was living in New York and I was walking around <clears throat> and I saw a poster for a gospel concert, and I thought, oh, that sounds cool. I'm going to go to that. I went to the concert, and, you know, half the people there were the kinds of people who go to all cultural events in Manhattan, and the other half were people for whom this was religion. It really was church. It was 
um, a group of middle and later middle-aged African American who were dressed up <clears throat> in their finest clothes. I was seated next to a woman and I said, do these concerts happen all the time? Because I'd never heard of a gospel concert in New York. And she said, oh yes, there's a whole circuit. We know the circuit, the people come through all the time. So of course I was sitting there going, oh my God, I've got to write this story. I mean, this is amazing, who knew? And this was only a few blocks from my house. So it was even more amazing to me. Like this goes on right by my house and I didn't even know it. I thought, I want to write about gospel music. Now, just as a little aside, that's a topic. That's not a story idea. That's a very different thing. It's a, it's, it's a listing in the encyclopedia. It's not a story. So I thought, someday I'm going to figure out how to, f oh, I will find the story that allows me a portal into this world, because I really want to write about this world. So I am a collector of weird headlines. For many, many years, my, the headline that I had on my bulletin board was, Christ the King aims for revenge. <laughs> and I thought, yes, whatever that means, I love it. Um, and I always look for, for odd headlines and just save them. Sometimes I actually read the stories, but usually I'm just going for the headlines. But I saw a headline, and I also, just as an aside, and I highly recommend this for entertainment, I always read the obituaries, which are, in many cases, and frankly, in really any newspaper, they are among the most interesting sections of the papers. They're, they're little narratives. They're just wonderful, and often, they will have a story that you want to learn more about, or they'll hint at a world that you didn't know existed and you may want to pursue as a writer. And just as a reader, they're, they're marvelous little stories. So I was having my usual obituary reading, a very cheerful point, part of my day, and I saw an obituary in the New York Times, and usually these are figures who are not local, obituaries with people with some more prominence of some sort. And it was an obituary for a man who was in his early 50s, um, who was, his, they had his name and it described that he was a gospel singer. His funeral was so big that the town of Jackson, Mississippi, which is not a small town, had closed all of the roads downtown for a few hours during the funeral because there was such a huge turnout. And a light bulb went off. <clears throat> Sometimes I would actually like if I had an actual light bulb. So I go, oh, okay, story. Um, I just thought, here's someone I've never heard of whose funeral is so eventful that a significant sized city in the US closed down for his funeral. I think the tension between this, this is someone I never heard of and this is someone of great import in his world, that tension really interested me. And I thought, I have my story now. I wanna, I wanna know who he was and as it turned out, the group that he was part of, the Jackson Southerners, had planned to continue performing even though he had passed away. I made contact with the group and pled my case to them about why I wanted to write about them and, and through them I felt that I could see this world of gospel and it, it seemed like a way in to a subculture. Before I went down to meet with them in Mississippi, and I was ended up traveling with them as they toured for a couple of weeks. Everyone said to me, well, have you read this definitive um, book on gospel music and this historical guide and this academic treatise on gospel music? And I said, uh, no. And there were two powerful reasons that I hadn't. One is, I'm lazy. Um, but the other, 
more valuable reason is that I thought I'm going to be with the people who live this life. I want to learn from them. I'm fortunate enough to, as much as I have plenty of ego, when I'm reporting, I don't. I don't suffer from the self-consciousness of going to people and saying, I don't know anything about your world. I, I didn't read the academic treatise on gospel music. I want to learn about your world, and I want to learn it from you. Now, it seemed to me that there might be details in history that I could get later, but the baseline was I wanted to learn it from the people who were living it. And sometimes it would make me seem very ignorant, but I, I was okay. I, I didn't mind it. The fact is, everyone wants to tell their story. And if you say, I don't know anything about your world, tell me. It's really one of the most wonderful things you can say to anybody. And it's a rare thing that someone doesn't want to be heard and want to display to you their mastery of their life and who they are and the world they live in. I think it's also very important for a writer coming from New York, from a fancy magazine, from you know, having what seems to be all of the accoutrements of privilege and knowledge to say, you know what, actually in your world, I know nothing. In your world, you are the person with all the privilege because you know it. I don't find it uncomfortable to say I don't know your world because I don't. And I don't need to learn about it from books. And after I spent this time traveling, of course when I came back and I was writing my story, there was information I needed to find you know, dates and history and material that I hadn't necessarily gotten <clears throat> while traveling. But I felt that the dynamic was what I wanted it to be, to say, I'm your student. Teach me about your world. And then when I felt like I understood it, to say, turn to my readers and say, I want to teach you about this wonderful place I visited, this wonderful story I learned and this chance I had to see a culture that I hadn't otherwise known about. So when I say there's wisdom and ignorance, um, I, I mean it, I really mean it. I think we need to ask questions and to be proud of not knowing. I mean, we're sort of living in a moment where there's lots of screaming and yelling and not a lot of listening and the probably the only way you can ever learn is to listen. And reporters really should be listening, and I, I think most of them do, and most of them need to, but it's, it's something that I am always repeating to myself and remembering that that's my job. My job isn't to know more than the people I'm writing about. It's to acknowledge that I know less and to ask to be taught. One of the most interesting experiences I had um, being ignorant was when I did write about a 10-year-old boy. I mean, it's one thing to go to a person who's been traveling in the gospel circuit for 40 years and say, I don't know anything. It's another to say to a 10-year-old boy, I don't know anything. Um, and I remember when my son, my son turned 10, I thought, I hope he doesn't read the story and, <laughs> and recognize that I really didn't know anything about what it was like to be 10. I'd love to tell you a little bit about the, the backstory of that piece, and, and then I'm going to read to you a little bit from it. S this was um, an interesting, <laughs> bold, decision on my part that was made entirely ignorantly and without any forethought. So I just want you to know, I'm not saying I'm smart and strategic. I'm saying I was blindly optimistic, and that's how I ended up in this situation. Esquire had approached me 
and said, we're doing a, a, a big issue called The American Man. We want a story about the American man at age 10, which I just found very funny and appealing. And they said, and that American man is Macaulay Culkin, the actor who was 10 at the time. They'd already done a photo shoot with him. This, you know, they had the layout ready. They just wanted me to profile him. Well, it was my first chance to write for Esquire. I should have used a little bit of common sense and said, yes, whatever you say. But instead, I said, but I don't really care about Macaulay Culkin. <laughs> On the other hand, I thought, wow, 10. What's, I wonder what it's like to be a 10-year-old boy. Now, I didn't have kids at the time, and many of my friends also didn't have kids. So this really was like doing exotic travel. Um, my editor at Esquire, and I to this day give him a lot of credit because you don't necessarily sell lots of magazines by featuring an unknown sort of ordinary kid from New Jersey as your cover subject. But I guess I must have seemed, and I know myself well enough to know I must have definitely seemed extremely passionate about my version of the story, which was, wouldn't it be much more interesting to find out what life is like for just a regular 10-year-old kid? I mean, I can already tell you what Macaulay Culkin's life is like. He's got an agent and a manager, and he doesn't do anything, and he's, you know, sad. Um, <laughs> Well, my editor uh, said, okay. I immediately thought to myself, oh no, what have I done? <laughs> I mean, celebrity profiles are easy. They show up, they're deposited by their manager, you talk to them, they give you pat answers, boom, done, very easy. Writing about an ordinary person is much harder. Moreover, I didn't know any 10-year-old boys. And <clears throat> I didn't know where to find one. <laughs> I called a lot of my friends. I said, do you know any 10-year-old boys? And they said, why are you asking that? <laughs> I, and what was worse is I lived in Manhattan. I didn't want to write about a boy in Manhattan because that's a very unusual childhood. And really what I was looking for was a childhood that was a more typical American childhood, which meant the, sub the suburbs or small town. So my friends, you know, warily, one friend said, well, I do know someone who knows someone who has a 10-year-old. <laughs> now I laugh because, boy, do I know a lot of 10-year-olds, but that's because I, I have one of those. Um, <laughs> but I, I was introduced to this young person, Colin Duffy. Um, I spoke to his parents. And really, I, I have to give them a lot of credit because it must have sounded very vague. I said, I just really want to know what Colin's life is like. Um, and I know that it, it just must have sounded very odd. And this is a, a problem I run into all the time because I often write about people who are convinced they are not worth writing about. And I have to spend a lot of time saying, no, no, seriously, you're super interesting. And they, they don't believe it. And that in itself can be very interesting. But his parents agreed, if he agreed, which he did, sort of like, yeah, wh whatever. Um, very 10-year-old-ish. And I said, well, really what I want to do is come hang out with him and go to school and you know, really spend a lot of time over this two-week period. And, and they agreed and he agreed. And then I showed up Monday morning and I think he had second thoughts. I said, I'm here, I'm ready, let's go to school. And you know, I don't know how many of you have boys or kids of that age, but the idea of being followed to school by an adult woman is, <laughs> is concerning. And um, he shunned me. And I, I really did feel like a geisha. I walked like 10 paces behind him. <laughs> got to school and I squeezed into one of those little chairs and and he wouldn't talk to me or really look at me and I was just thinking what was so wrong with Macaulay Culkin? 
So the, that first day goes by, um, and you know, to go back to my theme, this was a really interesting case of feeling that the power was out of my hands. I, I was the person who had to learn. And there was no, I, I couldn't command him to reveal himself to me or even be available to me. And there was a very humbling process of sitting there and you know, I, I got value out of sitting in the class and watching them name their hamster and whatever else they were doing that day in school. And, and at the end of the day, he walked home again, sort of shunning me. The next day I showed up and I thought, here we go. And at that point, the clock was ticking. I mean, I had a story due. And I wanted to say, Colin, look, I don't know what your problem is, but I've got a story due. So start revealing yourself <laughs> now. Um, it doesn't work, you know? So I spent another day sitting in the classroom thinking, this is humiliating. In the meantime, just as an aside, my editor had called me and said, you know, Susan, just a couple of things. It's our biggest issue of the year, you know, December. And we've sent all the pages already to the printer, except for yours. So, like, the magazine is printed, basically, except for your story. And so we're waiting for you and your story. And I thought, oh, no pressure. Really, that's fine. No problem. This kid won't talk to me. Um, at the end of the second day, and this is where I truly learned the value of ignorance, the value of feeling humble in front of the task of being a writer. At the end of that day, when Colin finally turned to me and said, do you want to come see my room? First of all, I knew that I was able to do the story, that he had decided to let me in, to learn about who he was and what his life was like. It was also really valuable to think I sat for, you know, 24 or 48 hours just stewing in, in my not knowing. Not knowing him, not knowing how to get to him, and also not coming armed with information. There was no information that was gonna help me. All I could do was think, I did truly wanna know what it's like to be 10 years old. And I've, I've just got to wait that out and hope that I get there. It convinced me that that, that leap of into your not knowing is, is really an essential one when you want to be a writer. And then when you come leaping out, you're filled with the excitement of wanting to say, I've just learned something wonderful. I learned what it's like inside the head of a 10-year-old boy. I just want to read, um, I'm keeping an eye on the clock because I want to make sure to have time for questions, but I thought I would just read a little bit from the piece and, um, and then get back to talking a little bit more. By the way, um, Colin's mom called me not that long ago and she said, um, Oh, I, you know, just want to say hi and wondered if you wanted to <clears throat> kind of get an update on Colin. And I said, sure. I said, wow, he must be like 11 or 12. And she said, Susan, he's 30. <laughs> if Colin Duffy and I were to get married, we would have matching superhero notebooks. We would wear shorts, big sneakers, and long baggy t-shirts depicting famous athletes every single day, even in the winter. We would sleep in our clothes. We would both be good at Nintendo, but Colin would be better than me. We would have some homework, but it would never be too hard, and we would always have just finished it. We would eat pizza and candy for all of our meals. We wouldn't have sex, but we would have crushes on each other and magically, babies would appear in our home. 
we would win the lottery and then buy land in Wyoming where we would have one of every kind of cute animal. All the while, Colin would be working in law enforcement, probably the FBI. Our favorite movie star, Morgan Freeman, would visit us occasionally. We would listen to the same eurythmic song over and over and over again and watch two hours of television every Friday night. We would both be good at football, have best friends, and know how to drive. We would cure AIDS and the garbage problem and everything that hurts animals. We would hang out a lot with Colin's dad. For fun, we would load a slingshot with dog food and shoot it at my butt. We would have a very good life. Here are the particulars about Colin Duffy. He is 10 years old on the nose. He is 4 feet 8 inches high, weighs 75 pounds, and appears to be mostly leg and shoulder blade. He's a handsome kid. He has a broad forehead, dark eyes with dense lashes, and a sharp, dimply smile. I, am, I have rarely seen him without a baseball cap. Let's skip forward a little bit here. His current best friend is named Japheth. He used to have another best friend named Ozzy. According to Colin, Ozzy was found on a doorstep, then changed his name to Michael and moved to Massachusetts, and then Colin never saw him or heard from him again. He has had other losses in his life. He is old enough to know people who have died and to know things about the world that are worrisome. When he dreams, he dreams about moving to Wyoming, which he has visited with his family. His plan is to buy land there and have some sort of ranch that would definitely include horses. Sometimes when he talks about this, it sounds as ordinary and hard-boiled as a real estate appraisal. Other times, it can sound fantastical and wifty and achingly naive, informed by the last inklings of childhood, the musings of a balmy real estate appraiser assaying a wonderful and magical landscape that erodes from memory a little bit every day. <clears throat> the collision in his mind of what he understands, what he hears, what he figures out, what popular culture pours into him, what he knows, what he pretends to know, and what he imagines makes an interesting mess. The mess often has the form of what he will probably think like when he is a grown man, but the content of what he is like as a little boy. He is old enough to begin imagining that he will someday get married, but at 10 he is still convinced that the best thing about being married will be that he will be allowed to sleep in his clothes. His father once observed that living with Colin was like living with a Martian who had done some reading on American culture. As it happens, Colin is not especially sad or worried about the prospect of growing up, although he sometimes frets over whether he should be called a kid or a grown-up. He is settled on the word kid-up. Once I asked him what the biggest advantage to adulthood will be, and he said, the best thing is that grown-ups can go wherever they want. I asked him what he meant exactly, and he said, well, if you're grown-up, you'd have a car, and whenever you felt like it, you could get into your car and drive somewhere and get candy. <laughs> Do we have a minute to read a little bit more? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> the girls in Collins' class at school are named Courtner, Terror, Spacey, Lizard, Maggot, and Diarrhea. They do have other names, but that's what we call them, Colin told me. The girls aren't very popular. They're about a, as popular as a piece of dirt, his friend Japheth said. Or, you know that couch in our classroom? That couch is more popular than any girl, a thousand times more. They talked for a minute about one of the girls in their class, a tall blonde with cheerleader genetic material, who they allowed was not quite as gross as some of the other girls. Japa said that a chubby, awkward boy in their class was boasting that this girl liked him. No way, Colin said. She would never like him. I mean, not that he's so, I don't know. I don't hate him because he's fat. I hate him because he's nasty. Well, she doesn't like him, Japa said. She's been really mean to me lately, so I'm pretty sure she likes me. 
Girls are different, Colin said to me. He hopped up and down on the balls of his feet, wrinkling his nose. Girls are stupid and weird. I have a lot of girlfriends, about six or so, Japheth said, turning contemplative. Don't exactly remember their names, though. Just read one last section. <clears throat> Until the lottery comes through and he starts putting together the Wyoming land deal, Colin can be found most of the time in the backyard. Often, he will have friends over. Regularly, children from the neighborhood will gravitate to the backyard, too. As a technical matter of real estate law, title to the house and yard belong to his parents, but Colin possesses it from at least four each afternoon until it gets dark. As yet, the fixtures of teenage life either hold little interest for him or are not his to have. He has at the moment, he is at the moment very content with his backyard. For most intents and purposes, it is as big as Wyoming. One day, certainly, he will grow, and it will shrink, and it will become simply a suburban backyard, and it won't be big enough for him anymore. This will happen so fast that one night, he'll be in the backyard believing it a perfect place, and by the next night, he will have changed, and the yard as he imagined it will be gone, and this era of his life will be behind him forever. Most days, he spends his hours in the backyard building an evil spiderweb trap. This entails running a spool of his father's fishing line from every surface in the yard until it forms a huge web. Once, a garbage man picking up the family's trash got caught in the trap. Otherwise, the evil spiderweb trap most, mostly has a deterrent effect because kids in the neighborhood who roam over know that Colin builds it there. I do it all the time, he says. First I plan who I'd like to catch in it, and then I get started. Trespassers have to beware. One afternoon when I came over, Colin started building a trap. <clears throat> he selected a victim for inspiration, a boy in his class who'd been pestering him, and began rapping. He was entirely absorbed. He moved from tree to tree, wrapping. He laced fishing line through the railing of the deck and then back to the shed. He circled an old jungle gym, something he'd outgrown and abandoned, and then crossed over to a bush at the back of the yard. Briefly, he contemplated making his dog Sally part of the web. Dusk fell. He kept wrapping, paying out fishing line an inch at a time. We could hear mothers up and down the block hooting for their kids. Two tiny children from next door stood transfixed at the edge of the yard, uncertain whether they would end up inside or outside the web. After a while, the spool spun around in Colin's hands one more time and then stopped. He was out of line. It was almost too dark to see much of anything, although now and then the light from the deck would glance off a length of line and it would glint and sparkle. That's the point, he said. You could do it with thread, but the fishing line is invisible. Now I have this perfect thing and the only one who knows about it is me. With that, he dropped the spool, skipped up the stairs of the deck, threw open the screen door, and then bounded into the house, leaving me and Sally the dog trapped in his web. <laughs> Thank you. I have so much more that I'd like to say, but I, I think I'd like to open it to questions um, just because we're, the, the clock is ticking away. Is that, does that sound good? I just wondered if you had any um, guidelines about how you revise, how you know what to cut out and what to keep. It's a very good question, having just done that um, extensively over the last <clears throat> month or two with my manuscript. First of all, I think your, your brain is processing the material and things start rising and other things begin receding and it's really useful to notice what's going on and even in your 
what you're returning to in your mind. But I also really love talking my stories out with people and telling them about what I've been seeing and listening to what I'm saying. Because often I end up telling them not the thing that I thought was interesting, but something that actually resonated more and I don't even realize it. I mean, you think about when you come back from a trip and <clears throat> people say, how is Paris? And you might think, you're gonna say, oh, the Eiffel Tower. And you never say that. You say, you know, I met this weird guy on the train and he, you know, hit me over the head with a baguette. And uh, you, you find yourself editing yourself. So it's really useful to do that. But when it's on the page, and I would say the easiest way to edit yourself and to see what you should throw out is to read out loud. And if you find yourself skipping things because it's a little boring, then you better cut it. I'm also, I've also become a pretty brutal editor of myself. I used to think, oh no, it's, I can't touch a word. And I was almost afraid to jiggle things around or move things because I felt like the entire story would fall apart. And I've gotten a lot more confident about that. And I think it's, it's really good. And one trick that I find very useful is I will cut something, but I don't throw it away. I open another file and I paste it in a new file. And I think, well, it's there. I, I haven't lost it. And if I miss it and want it back, it's right there. I, I don't have to rewrite it. It's there. And it's really interesting to me how rarely I end up going back and using those pieces. You know what it's a little like? You know how all these closet organizers say to you, if you haven't worn something in three years, put it in a box and put it in your basement, and if you haven't gone looking for it in a year, just take it right to Goodwill. It's kind of like that. Um, take the stuff out that you have a question about, but hang on to it. You give yourself a little bit of, of solace in knowing that it's not really gone, but take it out. And interestingly, you will often not miss it. Another example of this, um, I, a couple of months ago, my son was writing something for school and the file crashed and he lost the whole thing and he was absolutely devastated. And I remembered once writing a piece, not a really, really long piece, but writing a piece and having the file just poop out and I lost it and I thought, oh my God, woe is me, it's ruined, I, I can't possibly do this. Then, well, I don't know, I, I know the story, so let me sit, and I rewrote it. Not only was it quite close to what I'd lost, but it was probably a lot better. Um, and I think that what it taught me was to be a little bolder about throwing things out and seeing. Um, your, less is always better than more. And I noticed today I was revising my manuscript a little and there were several times where I described something not once, not twice, but three times. And I thought, I don't know, three times is probably too much. Maybe twice is too much. Like once probably was enough. But that's sometimes you thinking out loud on the page. So you have to learn to say, okay, that was me almost working out different ways to do this description, and now I can just really strip it down to the very, very best of that. It's always more powerful to have something lean and mean than to, to go on excessively. Someone else? Yes, sir? You have the mic? So I'm guessing you take copious notes when you're doing this. How do you keep them straight? Well, it's a challenge because I take notes by hand. And I, well, let me begin differently, which is to say, <clears throat> and this will be appalling and shocking to people who teach journalism, but I don't think notes are that important. Notes are important for quotes, and for very specific details. What's really important, and that we keep forgetting to remind students and young writers, 
is to actually pay attention. Now, if I were to go home and someone would say, tell me about the event tonight, I could tell you pretty well about the event, and I'm not taking notes. But I'm here, I'm paying attention, I'm noticing. So we've, we often get a little obsessive about notes and note taking and how to take enough notes. And um, I would say I probably take fewer notes than you'd think I would. But I'd like to think I pay more attention. And sometimes I find note taking gets in the way of paying attention. Certainly with quotes, I'm writing it down because I, I believe I, there's, to me, no gray area in fact-based writing. It's fact and quotes are as they were said or not. They, there's no in-between. And if I don't get a quote really well documented, I do it as a paraphrase. I, I'm not going to quote if it's not a quote. So that's when it matters to be, you know, scribbling furiously. But all of that other stuff is really more about listening and, and truly being in the experience. It, wouldn't, it would be hard for me to take the kind of notes that would be valuable to me. I mean, nothing here, I mean, this was so much a, a piece about tone and about, in many ways, trying to replicate the voice of a 10-year-old boy and the sort of scrambled, weird world view that you have when you're 10. There are no notes that would have helped me in that. What really mattered was to just kind of immerse myself in his world and begin thinking, like, God, there's something really strange about the way you see the world when you're 10, because you're, you're still a baby, but you're starting to have ideas about what life is all about, but they're just wrong, you know, they're... <laughs> um, but that wasn't about notes. That was about paying attention. And certainly then I wanted quotes to use that would have supported that. But I don't use a tape recorder. I think um, I just don't like the whole kind of mechanism of pulling out a tape recorder and turning it on and turning it off and transcribing. And if you're spending all day with someone, a tape recorder isn't very useful. I've used them when I had a concern about a legal issue with the person and, want, and knew I needed a tape. Or if, um, it, I mean, you know, there have been times, but generally I don't use a tape recorder because it simply wouldn't be useful to me. A day with a 10-year-old boy, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what I'd be taping. Um, it's also been shown definitively that writing things down embeds it in your subconscious much more permanently and much more thoroughly than if you sit with a tape recorder. And it makes sense. I mean, you're, you're not interacting with the information. So to me, writing, taking the notes by hand, um, I remember it a whole lot more. And I also am essentially editing. I'm with someone, and I'm writing down what matters. I'm not writing every single verbatim exchange. I'm, I'm editing. I'm curating the information. It's true when you sit down to write, you sometimes find that, wow, I hadn't thought that would be important. And now that I'm writing the piece, I realize that this sort of subplot of the story, it turns out to be more important. And that's when you then have to do some backfill and do some reporting or interviews um, after the fact if you discover that a story just emerged differently than you expected. That's helpful. Anyone else? Grab the mic. Hello. Um, how would you go about creating and slipping like subtext and underlying meanings beneath your piece, like what you're writing, and being obvious enough that a clever reader will pick it up on it, but not so in your face that it's just like, uh. 
Can you say the very beginning of the question? Um, how would you go about creating and slipping subtext slash underlying meanings throughout your piece? That's a really good question, and I, I have to applaud you. I, I think that's one of the most sophisticated questions anyone has asked me in my many, many talks, so my um, compliments. I think all of my pieces rise or fall on that. Um, you know, they're on one hand a sort of documentary about a slice of life, a recording um, in, you know, kind of cinema verite of the unfolding of a situation, but what makes them, I think, have a different quality is that they're inflected with perspective and subtext. Some of that is purely um, unconscious. I think when you're writing, and I, I, that, that may sound very unsatisfying, but I think when you've really immersed yourself in a world and it, it's sort of percolated in your head, it begins having meaning that you're not even sure, that you may not even be able to articulate, but the word choices you make and the scenes you choose to include are all affected by that perspective that has, that is there in your mind without you necessarily expressing it. And sometimes, and I know this will sound weird, sometimes a reader sees that more than you do. It's almost like someone saying you have an, your accent is um, so whatever. You think, I don't have an accent. Um, the fact that it's your perspective often makes it invisible to you, but the reader sees it. Word choice is an example of that. And I, it was very funny because um, someone who was doing a read on one section of my new book said to me, oh, I love how you use all of these kind of animal adjectives describing him because he really does seem sort of like th this one particular figure, you know, almost like an animal. I thought, wow, did I do that? Um, and I would, I guess in a way it's really authentic if it's, and that comes from feeling like you really know the material, that you are, that you've really wrestled with the material and it's, it's coming out of you the way you would tell a story out loud and you would, you would tell it in a certain way. I mean, no one, no one tells an objective story. They tell it with their perspective. I think once you feel that you know what the theme is, or you begin noticing these rising currents in something you're writing, then you go about supporting them. Again, by word choice, by um, metaphors, just to keep bringing it back to a theme to strengthen it, but you don't ever want it to be really overt. Um, it's, it's a tricky thing. My last book, I really felt that it was, um, the entire book was about the question of immortality and could anything live forever. But, and there was a point in the book where it was important to say that, but throughout the rest of the book, I, I really had to be careful not to be too overt about that, but rather let the material move you toward the same conclusion that I had come to. I hope that's helpful. I mean, that's one of those things that you would love to be able to have a, a bullet list of how to do it, but much of it uh, is very much a subconscious act of, of creativity. I think there was someone, oh, here's someone. Since most of us are on the unsuccessful part of writing, <laughs> and you are on the other end of the successful part of writing, how do you stay centered? You mean as a person? Um, due to my dazzling success? <laughs> oh my God, I have no trouble. I mean, um, you know, it, it, I'll tell you the honest truth. Writing never gets easier. It, it, you may get 
paid better for it and you may get more attention for it and more acclaim for it, but the act of writing a good sentence doesn't get any, any easier. And I, I sort of wish someone had told me that in the beginning and it was finally revealed to me when I was a young writer at The New Yorker and I saw Roger Angel, who I worship as a writer, pacing around and looking very upset and distraught and I said to my editor, like, that's Roger Angel, what's he upset about? And he said, well, he's waiting to hear from his editor about his piece. And I thought, oh, are you kidding? I mean, this guy is, like, you're kidding. <laughs> and my editor said, you know, it, it, you don't build equity as a writer, you certainly build professional equity, but every piece is only as good as the, the one you just did. And it, it's, it's very humbling at all times. Um, and when I say it gets harder, I think you set your own standard. I mean, when I'm writing a new book, I'm writing a review saying, this isn't as good as her other book. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I mean, it, it's, it might, I mean, it's kind of funny. It's also truly the case that um, you, you don't cruise. I don't fret about getting work. I know that I have work, so that, that part of it, I don't sweat. Um, and certainly all the, that kind of mechanical stuff or the, the practical stuff, I don't sweat. But I, I am fighting with every sentence just exactly as you are, just exactly as I was the first time I wrote. So as a follow-up question. Sure. Is it easier to write for a magazine than it is to write a book? Yes, uh, infinitely easier. I mean, for writing a book, it, the, the simple act of writing that much and structuring something to keep people's interest for 300 pages is really challenging and not always successful. I mean, I think we've all read lots of books that kind of fizzle midway. So, and, and even in a practical way, once my book crossed into like 200 pages, I began losing track of where things were in the manuscript. I couldn't remember if I'd already introduced a character or not. I mean, it's, it's just unwieldy and it, it is very, it, it can be really hard. You have total freedom, you know, if you want to write a sentence, a weird sentence, nobody is, until your publisher sees it, nobody's telling you not to. So you have a lot of freedom and a sense of agency that's kind of wonderful, but it is much, much harder. Um, in fact, so many people have said to me, I, I could never imagine being interested in a subject for long enough to do a book about it. And that, that also is an issue, um, feeling midway like, whoa, this is a stupid subject. And uh, I would say, I wouldn't believe any writer who didn't admit that there's a point halfway where they think, I don't know, maybe I'll get hit by a bus. You know, this is just horrible. And I mean, it's really hard. It's also really fun if you feel that you made it, that you managed to get all the way through. I mean, I just turned in my book last week and I sort of can't believe it. And I think, God, did I really? I really managed to write 100,000 words and I really got it done? It is kind of mind boggling. Um, and magazine, well, there's one other factor, which is, um, and it all comes after the fact, which is when you write a piece for a magazine, you, you, there's no pressure on you for it to sell. The magazine either is read by subscribers or it's not, and you don't have the anxiety of, is this book going to succeed and be noticed? Or is it going to be reviewed well or not? You know, there's a lot of pressure that comes after the fact that 
it really is squarely on your shoulders. And with a magazine, you never have to worry about that. So it's very liberating. You do your piece, and then you don't, you're happy to see it in the magazine, and you don't have to worry. So your first piece was not with the New Yorker. My first piece ever? Yeah. Oh, no. I, I moved to Portland, Oregon. Well, my very first piece, I guess, was in my college newspaper. But I moved to Portland, Oregon right after college, and I worked for a little magazine there, and then worked for <clears throat> a really good alternative news weekly. From there, I started writing for magazines, um, not for The New Yorker right away, but for Rolling Stone and um, Mademoiselle, and uh, I can't remember. I mean, Outside Magazine, a bunch of different magazines. And I started writing for The New Yorker in 1986. Yeah. I'm 100 years old. <laughs> Raise an important question. There was a uh, speaker at the uh, Central Coast Writers Guild a couple of weeks ago, and he had talked about how he had done school in California, got out, but that what really got him going was he got involved with an independent weekly mm -hmm. up in Sacramento and got on their crime to court system and was able to pick up on a story, and then from that he was able to really take off. Right. Is that exposure to the weekly. And my understanding about thinking about a weekly is that you have a little bit longer right. deadline time. You right. You write more like a picture. <clears throat> you are writing news, which you have to have like six stories by the end of the day. Kind of stuff. Right. Well, I feel very lucky having come of age as a writer in the heyday of alternative news weeklies because a week schedule is actually a very nice one because you have 52 issues a year so you're not fighting for space the way you would in a monthly and there are only 12 issues and you have the time to go further with the story and dig in a little more and learn a little more you're not chasing a breaking news story um, and unfortunately m many of those papers are gone and it used to be my steady advice to anybody who wanted to do literary journalism, which was, you know, these weeklies are really a great place to do that. And to learn the discipline of writing, you know, for an audience with th the structure that would come with it. But you would have often have enough time to really, I, I mean, I'm really proud of the stories I wrote when I was, at Newsweekly, I mean, they were really um, pretty deep uh, investigations of subcultures, in, interesting news stories, and you really had the chance to do it. And there was also a, a kind of um, openness to stylish writing. It didn't have to fall into the newspaper kind of template. So they were fantastic places to get an education, and there's still a few around, but nothing like when I was first starting. It's, it's a shame. I'm curious, um, is there a profile that you have yet to do that you've been wanting to do for a long time? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, no, uh, I mean, there's no, um, like, famous individual who I secretly would love to talk to. Um, and I often try to think about that, like if, if I had a chance to, I mean, I, I, there are more like events and places that I really want to write about or subcultures that I want to write about <clears throat> and, and, and less so well-known people. I mean, I'd be really interested in, in interviewing sort of anybody, but there's no wish list of people. Can you talk about, um, as a, what do you, a creative nonfiction writer, can you talk about how fact-checking has changed in your life in the last 30 years? Oh my God, this is very funny. <laughs> the reason why I'm laughing is I spent um, most of my drive from San Francisco here trying to hire a fact checker to work on my book um, and somebody who was able to do it very quickly. 
because to your shock, perhaps, um, publishers don't do fact-checking. If you want your book fact-checked, you have to pay somebody to do it for you. You know, to tell you the truth, I mean, I've been at the New Yorker since 86. Their fact-checking hasn't changed at all, and it's probably the most rigorous in the industry. Um, they still won't let you say it was a hot day if the temperature only went up to 70. You know, that they will literally come to you and the fact checker will say, well, you know, you say here it was a hot day, but I called the National Weather Service and um, <laughs> there was a high of 69. I, don't, I wouldn't call that hot. I mean, in the dictionary, hot is defined as, and you're like, Sh shut up, okay. It was a warm day. Um, and I, you think I'm kidding, I'm not. I, I'm really not. And it, it's something that sometimes you just want to scream. But the end result is that you rarely have something wrong in your story. How has it changed in the industry in general? I would say that, I mean, the New York Times, the New York Times just got rid of their fact checkers. And now it, it, it's the copy editors who are supposed to fact check. And that means you are, you know, you're essentially saying, like, do what you can, but you don't really have time to fact check thoroughly. I'm not even sure why, except purely for money, that a decision like that would be made. It's also true that a lot of magazines never had very rigorous fact-checking, and, uh, you know, depending on the category of magazine, they, in many cases, they probably didn't think it was that important. Now I think the value of saying everything in here is true means more because we're surrounded by so much that we don't trust as being true. That's why, in, an, in a way, when I thought, well, I could, I could get away with not fact-checking my book, but you know what? I mean, in the atmosphere that we live in now, being able to say, as far as I know, and to our best ability, everything in here is really is true and accurate. And that makes me, I think it's worth it. It's worth spending the money. I was just going to ask, how is Colin doing? <laughs> Well, you know, it's weird because um, there were certain things that he talked about as a kid that ended up happening. He did move to Wyoming for a while. Um, he was going to go to veterinary school. Then he became, and I guess he didn't, but he became for a while a professional gambler. Um, you know, legally. I mean, I forget where he was living, but he was a professional poker player, I guess. And he, so he's had a, a, an interesting life. I mean, he, he's kind of bounced around a fair amount. And when I talked to his mom, he was actually back in New Jersey, living near, near his parents and helping his dad. His dad had been a school teacher and he was retired and had started um, like a, driving service and Colin was helping him with it so that was the last I heard but I was tempted to do a follow-up story about him but I just never I really feel in a way I just don't want to go back to the subject as, as I I never want to but in this case there's something about feeling like that was a moment in time and I just want to leave it as it as it was. I'm a, I'm a gardener by trade, and what I notice about your stories, and what I like the most about your stories, is that the very first part, you you make the soil. You you get us really in the mood for the meat of the story. So I'm just wondering the timing of it all. How do you do that? There was a moment um, at some point in in my professional life when I realized that that I could really steer the story that I I had to make this leap of assuming that readers wanted me to take them by the hand and and lead them through an experience and that it didn't require that I could uh, there were no rules and that I could 
I could make it an experience. And I particularly, I, w I was really liberated by suddenly thinking, oh, the, the lead of a story doesn't have to be a, a, a summary. It can actually be a sort of tone poem and, and, and just kind of lull you into the mood of the piece. And if I can do it well enough, you don't mind that you're not exactly sure what the story is about yet. And some, and that ended up being a, a real leap for me. I mean, doing it the first time and thinking, I, I can do this. I can, it's, it will, it makes logical sense that you're, I'm not starting off in some crazy unrelated place, but I could kind of seduce you in and, and get you comfortable with some of the language or some of the tonality of the piece before I begin telling you the specifics. I mean, for instance, I'm happy to mention that my new book is about the LA Public Library and an arson fire there in 1986, which was the largest library fire in the history of the US. And um, I begin the book talking about someone's hair. And I remember thinking, hmm, hair, I, will people wonder whether what if they picked up the wrong book and that the, this has a cover or it, saying it's about the library but they're reading about hair but there's there's a very particular reason that I begin there and and it's almost like a play I, I bring out a character and introduce you to the character and let him talk a little and then bring out another character and then the curtain starts pulling back and you begin seeing some of the stage set and uh, there's no rush. As long as I'm doing it well, there's no big rush. And at some point I say, okay, now every now all the actors are on the stage. You can see the entire set and now the play can begin. So that, and I, I really, um, I think I think of it that way as I'm writing. I mean, it, it, I guess I, it's also, um, I mean, there are a lot of cinematic kind of qualities to that as well, which is you you open with a very tight shot on something that doesn't show you the entire landscape that you're about to explore, but it pulls back slowly, and you, you sort of get your eyes adjusted and the, begin seeing what the colors are and the, the shadows, and then the camera pulls back and sometimes you think, wow, that wasn't what I was expecting. Um, but that's okay, I'm in it. I was wondering, since you've covered so many different curiosities, like there's your film funds to, you know, matadors. Has there ever <coughs> been influenced when I try something or like pick up a hobby or kind of be inspired from these people that you've seen? Every single story I've done midway through you should ask my husband. I'll come home and say, like, I'm going to raise pigeons. Or, <laughs> you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to library school. Or, I mean, I, and I lose perspective. And in fact, the time when I think he practically had me institutionalized was when I was writing a story about taxidermy. I don't remember if it's in this collection or not. And not, I'd gone to the World Taxidermy Championships. And I came home and I said to him, you know, so like, I'm thinking like a beaver. And he said, what, what happened to you? Um, and that's part of the process too, because usually I begin thinking, this is so weird. Why would anyone do this? Why would someone collect buttons? Why would someone do taxidermy? And midway through, I'm, I'm feeling like, oh, I get it. And it's amazing. And I really, I, I love it. I want to do this. And, um, and then there's a little bit of a separation where I think, okay, I guess I'm not going to be a taxidermist. I think I'm a writer, and, uh, and I'm writing about taxidermy, and I have to sort of step back. And have I ever actually continued the hobby? Um, I, I buy orchids, but I would never say it's a hobby of mine. I never started doing it in any, in any real way. Um, and I'm not sure if there was anything else where I found myself 
you know, drinking the Kool-Aid completely. Uh, but <clears throat> except for one instance where I, I wrote about children's beauty pageants and I did not come home saying, I have a great idea. Like, he's cute, we can put him in a beauty pageant. Um, almost everything else, I've had this moment where I felt completely absorbed in it and thought, I get it, I totally get it, it's amazing. Yes, ma'am? Um, would you comment briefly on a project that didn't work out, that something that you had a lot of interest in, but for some reason you decided to abandon it? Because I can't imagine that every single idea you have uh, is brought to fruition there probably you have so many ideas, and some make the cut and some don't. Right. Comment on that. Well, I have lots of ideas that I never go past the idea of, I mean, I never go further. I don't develop them beyond thinking, wow, that would be a cool story. Um, and I just don't have enough time to do them all, or something else is more compelling and seems like a better story, and I've got, a long list of those. Um, and that's just a gut feeling, um, a story that I begin losing confidence that it's really gonna be interesting or that I'll remain interested. <clears throat> I've only reported one story extensively that I never wrote. And there was really no reason that I didn't do it, in fact, I. I was thinking about it not long ago and thought, boy, I should go back and write it. It was a really good story. I don't, I don't remember why, and I'd done all the reporting, I'd traveled, I, you know, it was this wonderful story. I, I just don't recall whether something else came up that I had to do and then I never went back to it. I, I'm not sure. I'm pretty critical of story ideas, though, and it takes me you know, I, I'll come up with 10 ideas and nine of them I'll go, nah, 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 no, it's, a, it's, not, it's not a story. Um, so it takes me a while before I think, yeah, this one's, this one I'm really into. Other ones I know instantly. I just hear it and I want, I, I know I'm gonna do it. How did you come up with the idea for the new book? Like, how did that happen? Well, that was, accidental as many of these ideas are you know it's something that I, I kind of stumble into and then think wow that's a that's a great story um, I just moved to LA and <clears throat> I was being given a tour of the library and while I was walking around the library I started thinking God you know I love libraries, they're amazing. I've never really thought about them before, but that's kind of, it's so cool. Like I don't really know how they work and it, it started me thinking like, oh, you could write a book about libraries. And then I thought, no, 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 it's too vague, it's too, there's no arc. Then the person who was giving me the tour um, was sniffing one of the books and I thought, Oh, that's weird, and um, I said, like, what's up with that? And he said, well, you know, you can smell smoke in some of these books still. And I said, oh, did they used to let people smoke in the library? And I was surprised, and he said, no, no, the fire, the big fire. It shut the library for six and a half years. And I said, what? It did what? And I walked out thinking, I don't know anything about this. I don't know any more details than that. But the idea that the Los Angeles Public Library had a fire that, you know, he said to me, well, this is the biggest library fire in the history of the US, and I had never heard of it, knew nothing about it. Um, I just thought, I have to learn about this. And I was off to the races. So. I hope you're all dying to read it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>